Good evening from our studio here in Tarakona. This is Star TV News with me, Mumodo Bailabare. Coming up tonight, Gambia Food Testing Laboratory to start operation this year, announces Trade Minister. Gambia Cyber Security Alliance launches groundbreaking five-month training program for GAF personnel. Gambia Senior Secondary School 98 Alumni Association donates furniture worth over 800000 to its alma mater. On the international news, Sudan fighting RSF accused of targeting civilians in Gezira. Israeli Lebanon classes violence escalates in border areas. Argentina economic woes, annual inflation rate reaches 211%. This and many more in just a moment. To the news in details now, the Minister for Trade, Regional Integration and Employment during a press conference in Banjul confirmed to journalists about the upcoming commencement of the country's inaugural food testing laboratory. The Minister outlined this milestone while also highlighting the achievements of the Ministry in the past years. Modi El Baji attended the press briefing and he files in this report. One major factor faced by food exporters in the Gambia is the lack of an accredited food testing laboratory, which the government of the Gambia, through the Ministry of Trade, intends to find a remedy by building a state-of-the-art food testing laboratory that will position the Gambia in the export industry. The Minister of Trade, Babukar Ojuf, has disclosed that the Gambia will be boosted with a modern food testing facility this year. So the ministry has funded the construction of a national reference food testing laboratory under the auspices of the Gambia Standards Bureau, which is the institution mandated by law to provide conformity assessment of goods, which includes testing and certification. I'm pleased to announce that the construction of this lab is complete and we have secured some support from the West African Competitiveness Project to provide part of the equipment needs of the laboratory and to support it in acquiring international accreditation. The lab is expected to begin operations by the middle of this year. Related to this is the Gambia Standard Bureau is very well advanced in the establishment of a national certification body, which when accredited this year, will be able to provide internationally recognized certification for foods meant for export. This is significant because currently one of the major bottlenecks for export or exporting goods is the lack of recognized certification. Trade Speaking on the issue of employment, Minister Juve said the National Employment Technical Committee has been constituted to guide effective implementation of the policy. Approval of the National Employment Policy and Action Plan 2022-2026 following the approval of the policy the National Employment Technical Committee has been constituted to guide the effective implementation of the policy and is expected to be inaugurated before the end of this month. This committee has functions in threefold. You have the main committee, you have employment champions, you have the development partners. A National Employment Forum is slated for early this year. This forum will be a two-day activity where key stakeholders will be invited to discuss the status of employment in the Trade Minister said the country faces significant challenges in achieving sustainable development goals, particularly those related to his ministry's target of reducing trade deficit, enhancing decent employment and manufacturing. The Trade Minister underscored that his ministry has committed itself to pursuing more sectorial growth strategies. For Star TV, I am Mojo El Baji. The Gambia Cyber Security Alliance has initiated a pioneering five-month training program aimed at enhancing the capabilities of select Gambia Armed Forces personnel in the realm of cyber security. This comprehensive training seeks to provide the participants with essential knowledge and skills to crucial to effectively addressing cyber threats and crimes. Mariama Dem has more in this report. The training program, which commenced on January 11, 2024, will span five months and is designed to empower Gambia Armed Forces personnel with expertise in cybersecurity and cybercrime prevention, among other critical areas. Amadou Jalo is the program manager at the Gambia Cybersecurity Alliance. The coming five months will be very intensive as we will delve into the intricacies of cybersecurity, 
to fortify our defenses and uphold the integrity of our nation's digital infrastructure. Today, we gather to embark on a journey to ensure, and, uh, to ensure the security and resilience of our military operations in the face of evolving challenges. Amadou Eba, the founder and the president of the Gambia Cybersecurity Alliance, underscores that this initiative aligns with the organization's commitment to combating cyber crimes in the Gambia through bolstering the technical and capacity support for government entities and security personnel. For the armed forces to be one step ahead of the civilian population and even, you know, people out there or states out there that might be a potential threat to our national security. This is why we feel it is very, very important to provide the capacity building after successfully doing it with the police. And it is working very, very well with the Gambia police force. We feel the armed forces uh, cannot, be, cannot be left behind. The armed forces cannot be left behind in which sense? Because they are our last line of defense as far as our national security is. Major Momodu E. Jalo, Acting Director of Communications and IT at GAF, loves the training as a momentous and timely endeavor, marking the inaugural official training for the Gambia Armed Forces personnel. He emphasized the positive impact this initiative will have on GAF operations and expresses gratitude to the Gambia Cybersecurity Alliance for their valuable capacity building efforts. This is the first time that we have an official training for cybersecurity for the personnel of the Gambia Armed Forces. And as he rightly said, you will be the foundation of a unit that we en uh, en endeavor to have in the Armed Forces, which is a cybersecurity team. Therefore, as you embark on this training journey, I urge you to approach it with the same dedication and professionally that, that characterize the Gambia Armed Forces. The skills you are about to acquire here will undoubtedly fortify our collective ability to protect our digital assets and in extension contribute to the overall security of our beloved nation, the Gambia. Participants, I reiterate again, please approach this training with professionalism and dedication that characterize the Gambia Armed Forces for you to acquire the, the needed skills and knowledge. Additionally, Sanu Sidrame, the Director of Cybersecurity at the Ministry of Communications and Digital Economy, acknowledges and comments the collaborative effort in advancing cybersecurity in the Gambia. But escape the fact that we are digitally engulfed. For that being the case, we need to ensure that all relevant stakeholders are brought on board and play their uh, important quarter or contribute towards uh, strengthening and making sure our cyberspace is not only safe but resilient. Uh, the resiliency is something that we must really, really focus. And this cannot happen uh, because cybersecurity is not a measure that you can apply at a single point, but at multiple fronts and through collaborative efforts. Meanwhile, the Cybersecurity Alliance, established in 2014 and officially registered in 2019, stands as a prominent civil society organization dedicated to cybersecurity, cybercrime prevention, data protection, digital rights, and internet governance. Their comprehensive approach includes activities like cybersecurity awareness outreach, advocacy, and seminars, among others. Maria Madem, reporting for Stativi News. The Gambia Senior Secondary School, formerly Gambia High School, 98 Alumni Association consisting of former students on Wednesday donated furniture to the school. The gesture is worth over $800,000. The event was filled with excitement and gratitude as the ex-students came together to give back to their alma mater. By Cor has more in this report. The ex-students who have achieved success in various fields recognize the importance of providing a conducive learning environment for current and future students by extending the huge gesture. Their generosity and dedication led them to raise funds worth $815,000 meant to upgrade the school exams hall, staff room and computer lab to support the students' educational experience. Principal of the Gambia Senior Secondary School, Mohamed Baba Jalo, explains how the important donation comes from the class of 98. The class. Two, to ease congestion in the classrooms. To achieve this target, we engaged the class of 1998 for its intervention. Following the engagement, 
We notice the love and ambition they have for their alma mater, and also the high level of eagerness they have to make Gambia Senior Secondary School a center of excellence. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, we are very much delighted that they have honored our quest, and they are here today to hand over 200 tables and chairs, and additional 40 executive chairs and tables, plus a water dispenser and other items for this school. Events not only mark a significant milestone for the Gambia Senior Secondary School, but also showcase the power of unity and compassion among former students. Chairman of Class 98, Sadi Bukamaso, reminds and encourages students to take good care of the donated items. Chairman, distinguished guest, please permit me to also remind and encourage the students to please take great care of this furniture. This furniture would benefit you and may even benefit your offspring. Because if you look at us, we came in here 30 years ago. We left 24, 25 years ago. And today we are here, and I can bet you there are some furniture that are still here. And I, I can bet you that all the students that are sitting here today were not born when we graduated from Gambia Senior Secondary School. As the ceremony continued, the alumni association members took turns sharing their fond memories of their time at the school. They spoke about the impact the institution had on their life and how it shaped them into individuals they are today. Regional Director of Region 1, Bakari Sisi, thanked the class of 98 for giving back to the school that molded. In 2000, today we are here to celebrate. Celebrate their deep-rooted culture of the people of this country, which is caring and sharing. By 1998, you have upheld a great culture of this country, the culture of sharing and caring. Those that are given this much money of over 800,000, does that mean they have too much of money they don't have too much, but they feel the little they have, they could share with others. And there's no other better person than the school which has contributed in molding them, making them what they are today. Thank you very much for showing this gratitude. Back. The event was characterized with a captivating drama by students. With the support of the Alumni Association, the school is now better equipped to nurture the potential of every student and continue its legacy of excellence. Reporting for Star TV News, I am Baikor. And that report by Baikor will take us to the break. When we come back, we look at news outside the Gambia after this break. Welcome back. If you are just tuning in, this is Star TV News and we are broadcasting from our studio here in Sarakuna. We now take a look at news outside the Gambia. People trapped in Gezera State in Sudan are accusing the Parliamentary Rapid Support Forces of targeting civilians. The RSF has been fighting Sudan's army since April last year and took over the state in December. That led to the displacement of about half a million people, but many more remain in the state unable to leave. Al Jazeera's Hiba Morgan reports from Khartoum and a warning to viewers that may find some images distressing. Huh? This mobile footage shows civilians rounded up by the paramilitary rapid support forces in Meilig in central Sudan's Jazeera state. The RSF raided the town earlier this week and local groups say they killed several. A body can be seen a few meters away from the group. Are you dead or not yet? The man filming asks. The body doesn't move. More footage shows other people being rounded up. The man filming here accuses them of fighting on the side of the army in a town known to have no military facility. The RSF has been fighting Sudan's army since April and launched an attack on Jazeera State in December, taking it over after the army withdrew. Facilities such as hospitals, universities and banks were destroyed. 
At least 500,000 people were displaced due to the RSF attack on the state that once hosted the largest number of internally displaced people from the current conflict. Local groups known as resistance committees say the RSF has committed atrocities that include sexual violence, forcible disappearance of civilians and arbitrary killings. They say many bodies have been left in the streets for days and a lot of civilian homes turned into military camps. Many people who have tried to leave since the takeover have been forced to stay in the state. Those who were able to flee say they did so out of fear of falling victims to the RSF. We left our homes and had to move through allies and lesser known routes. When we left Madani, we saw the evidence of the atrocities that were committed by the RSF, the dead bodies on the streets. We feared for ourselves. We fled only with the clothes that we were wearing. In response to the accusations, the RSF told Al Jazeera that those who targeted civilians were not part of their forces and described them as outlaws. But with the history of the group targeting civilians going back even before the start of the current war, survivors of the crimes in Me'elig and Jazeera say they don't doubt who's responsible. Hiba Morgan Al Jazeera, Khartoum. Cross-border fire is continuing between Israeli forces and Hezbollah fighters in Lebanon. The Israeli town of Kiryat Simona took a direct hint on Thursday. It comes as a U.S. envoy, Amos Hosteni, is visiting Lebanon's Prime Minister, Nijab Mekati, in an attempt to mediate a solution as tensions escalate on the border. Al Jazeera's Laura Khan reports. There's tense quiet in northern Israel, punctuated only by cross-border fire between the Israeli army and Hezbollah. But with several military sites hit in the past few days, Israel is preparing for further escalation. The armed group Hezbollah says it was in response to the Israeli military assassinating senior commanders in Lebanon. About 80,000 people have been evacuated from the northern border. Further west, this becomes more evident. I've arrived at the village of Sasa. Just behind me in these houses, hundreds of people have been evacuated and soldiers have moved in, creating a closed military zone across the area in multiple towns across the border. The government says tens of thousands of people evacuated won't be able to return until there's no longer a threat from Hezbollah. We're en route to 899. This road runs almost directly parallel to the disputed border area between Israel and Lebanon. In fact, Lebanon is about 50 meters away and we've seen many empty towns along the way, almost completely empty roads, bar a few military vehicles. Uh, there's been military bases along here, checkpoints, sandbags blocking the way. This is the town of Shtula and you can see it's been completely blocked off by the Israeli military. Um, it might be a closed zone, I'm not sure if we can go in there or not. It's not just military preparation on the border. Ziv Hospital in Safad, along with other hospitals in the north, have been instructed by the government to be prepared to take in thousands of casualties. We've just arrived in another evacuated town called Shlomi. Again, empty homes, empty streets. And there's been fierce fighting between Israel and Hezbollah in this town. I just want to show you one of the points of territorial dispute between the two. This very large zigzagging wall Israel built two years ago. On the left of the wall is Israel. On the right is Lebanon. And just down south of that, you have Israeli homes. And if you look along the mountainside, this burnt out area, that's where Israel has been fighting Hezbollah and trying to push them back past the ridge. And although Israel says it wants to take the diplomatic path first, it's making clear a military escalation is still on the table. Laura Khan, Al Jazeera, Northern Israel. Argentina's annual inflation has stood past the 200 mark to 211 percent. The country has now outpaced Venezuela, where years of hyperinflation and economic woes have provoked a mass exodus. But Argentina's new far-right president, Javier Mele, says things will get better, but not before they get worse. Al Jazeera's Latin America editor, Lucia Newman, reports from Buenos Aires. In the blink of an eye, petrol prices in Argentina have doubled, 
while the local currency, the peso, is now worth half. Menus in most restaurants are no longer exhibiting prices. They're going up too fast to print. Every day it's worse. This is turning into Venezuela. The latest official inflation figure is more than 25% for the month of December, almost double what it was in November. The owner of this business loves guanacos, which is similar to a llama, and so he's decided to plaster the outside of his shop with 20 peso bills, which happen to feature guanacos. And that's because it's a lot cheaper than buying wallpaper. About 15 years ago, you could buy lunch and get changed with one of these bills. Now it's about to go out of circulation because it's practically worthless. Yet one thing remains stable, the way to buy and sell real estate. Prices are all in U.S. dollars, as they have been for decades. Broker Cecilia Bassi explains that bank loans are practically unheard of because interest rates are astronomical. You have to pay for all transactions up front, in cash and in U.S. dollars. It's a widespread practice. No one would dream of buying or selling property in local currency. With rare exceptions, Argentines have bought, sold and saved in U.S. dollars for nearly half a century to offset repeated devaluations and inflation. A vicious circle that the new government vows to break with a brutal fiscal adjustment. This year, the government will not print any money to cover the fiscal deficit. In the next three months, there will be hyperinflation as subsidies disappear, followed by a steep recession. The government's objective is to achieve zero inflation by December. Right now, that's hard to imagine. Next week, public transport in Buenos Aires will go up 45 percent, while salaries remain stagnant. Those who voted for President Javier Milei say they knew his cure for their economic woes would be extreme. What many aren't sure of now is whether they can withstand the medicine. Lucia Newman, Al Jazeera, Buenos Aires. That report brings us to the end of this edition of today's news. But before we go, the main points again. Gambia Food Testing Laboratory to start operation this year, announces Trade Minister. Gambia Cyber Security Alliance launches groundbreaking five-month training program for GAF personnel. Gambia Senior Secondary School 98 Alumni Association donates furniture worth over 800000 to its alma mater. On the international news, Sudan fighting RSF accused of targeting civilians in Gezira. Israeli Lebanon classes violence escalates in border areas. Argentina economic woes, annual inflation rate reaches 211%. That's it for this edition of today's news. Thank you very much for watching. Do stay tuned and enjoy the rest of the